I didn't know Manafort well. He wasn't with the campaign long. I don't know Papadopoulos. I don't know him. I saw him sitting in one picture at a table with me. That's the, that's the only thing I know about him. I never met this woman. I never saw this woman. I know nothing about QAnon. I just told I you. I know very little. You told me, but what you tell me doesn't necessarily make it fact. I don't know him very well. I have not spoken to him much. This is not a man I know well. Seems like a nice guy, though. Eventually, it happens to everybody. Hi again, everyone. It's 5 o'clock in the East. Donald Trump's age-old, or hardly knew him defense. When things get icky, sticky, Trump's suddenly a stranger to whoever it is in the crosshairs. He's barely met the person. He doesn't know anything about them, never heard of them. That same defense popped up again over the weekend. This time, it wasn't a person who'd once worked for him, but to an entire radical agenda laid out by Trump's closest allies, which includes eliminating the Department of Education, criminalizing abortion medicine, and installing an army of loyalists to replace those serving in federal agencies. We've covered it on this program before. We're talking, of course, about Project 2025. It is a 900-page blueprint for the next Republican administration, an extremely detailed, full-scale reimagining of something Steve Bannon said at the beginning of the first Trump term, right? The annihilation of the administrative state. It's Trump's plan for how the federal government would operate if he continues to listen to these allies. Project 2025 was created by the conservative group, the Heritage Foundation. Its president, Kevin Roberts, made this shocking comment last week. Watch. We are going to win. We're in the process of taking this country back. We are in the process of the second American revolution, which will remain bloodless if the left allows it to be. Now, several of Trump's closest allies and former officials are part of this effort which, quote, will remain bloodless if the left allows it to, end quote. That includes his closest person in charge of personnel from his first term. His name's John McEntee. It also includes Russell Vogt, Christopher Miller, and Paul Danz, who is the project's director. Yet three days after those comments from the Heritage Foundation's president became a press, you know what, storm, Trump trotted out his old, what? I have no idea what this is. I have no idea what Project 2025 is or who's behind it. Posting this on social media, quote, I disagree with some of the things they're saying and some of the things they're saying are absolutely ridiculous and abysmal. Anything they do, I wish them luck, but I have nothing to do with them, end quote. Trump's potential VP picks quickly ran to clear their guy, Donald Trump, of any association. Watch. I guarantee yep. there are things that Trump likes and dislikes about that 900-page document, but he is the person who will determine the agenda of the next administration. Think tanks do think tank stuff. They come up with ideas. They say things. I Look, I like Heritage Foundation. I agree with some of the things they stand for, but there's a bunch of scholars and people that turn around and work on different projects. But our candidate for president is Donald Trump. He's our guy, and he says he never heard of it. <laughs> the Heritage Foundation is a think tank, but it is a think tank, mind you, that during Trump's first administration directly handed Trump the names of the three Supreme Court justices he would eventually pick, three now Supreme Court justices who have made hugely consequential legal decisions, including to give Trump full immunity if he becomes president again, as well as furthering the agenda laid out in writing in those 900 pages authored by Project 2025, things like overturning Roe versus Wade undermining the power of federal agencies, giving the president, as we said, absolute immunity for official acts. Project 2025 is where we start the hour again with some of our favorite reporters and friends. Professor of History at NYU, author of Strong Men, Mussolini to the Present, Ruth ben is back, plus national political reporter for The Washington Post, author of Finish What We Started, The MAGA Movement's Brown War to End Democracy. Isaac Arnstorf is back. Also joining us, former Republican Congressman, MSNBC political analyst, David Jolly is here, and the president of Media Matters for America, Angela Carason is here. Angela, I have to start with you. You helped focus my attention on Project 2025. What does it say to you that it's getting so much bad press, Trump is distancing himself from it? I mean, I think it's what happens when you shine a little bit of a light on what's been going on for quite some time now with Project 2025. It's terrifying. I mean, the comment that Kevin Roberts made isn't even the scariest thing that we see when it comes to Project 2025. It's just a 
it's just small enough to latch on to so that we can talk about it in these moments. But it really isn't the scariest thing. And I'm not the least bit surprised that Trump sort of distanced himself from it. But it it doesn't really matter, right? I mean, it's very clear right now that they're focused on trying to win this election, and they, they understand what's popular and what's not popular. They know that Project 2025 will turn off voters. There it will. I mean, what, what it is calling for and prescribing will turn off even their own voters. I mean, some of the policies that have been tested, uh, you know, polled of Project 25, you know, even MAGA Republicans don't like, not huge numbers, but 30, 40 percent, uh, you know, hate some of these things. So they get it. Um, and, you know, the distancing was just enough to sort of try to move it through the news cycle, but not enough to burn it, right? We know what happens when Trump wants to incinerate something, right? Um, they're out there talking about their association with the Trump administration, you know, future Trump administration potential. They're out there bragging about their past work, you know, getting 64 percent of the, their recommendations put into policy in the first year of his first administration. Um, and they're out there continuing to do the work that they were doing before Trump denounced them. So. It was really a political and communications calculus, but it doesn't really matter. Um, the facts are there. They're still doing their work. They're still doing their work unabated or unchecked. So everyone sort of knows that it was a wink and a nod. Um, and they're going to continue to plug ahead with it. And that's the part that I think is ultimately really scary here is that this is a blueprint. It's a, it's a plan. It's not just a series of ideas. Um, one of the things, you know, Steve Bannon, I think, is a, a, had really helped explain Project 25 to so many and helped really rally a lot of big public support for it amongst the right. One of the things that he always reinforced about Project 2025 is that this is not rhetoric. That was a quote. This is not rhetoric. He would say over and over and over again, because he wanted to emphasize that this was a, a mechanism for enacting the very revenge that Donald Trump promised in his announcement speech when he for, for re-election in Waco, Texas. Um, so it is a through line here to this larger agenda. And I think that uh, I'm glad we're talking about it. We should continue to talk about it, because it is it is both frightening and it really helps put to a fine point a lot of the fear and anxieties I think people are feeling. Um, it's in black and white right on paper. Um, I, I want to get to everything you just laid out for us. I, I think the most important thing you just said is that Trump is shaving some of the corners off. It's in that platform where he takes out um, the Republican Party's um, abortion rhetoric because Trump ostensibly has this new line about leaving it to the states. He takes out marriage equality, a ban on, on, um, on same-sex marriage. And he is doing things to appeal to parts of his own coalition that don't like Project 25 and, 2025 and the most sort of hideous aspects of Trumpism. Um, in a way that should scare everybody, David Jolly. I mean, he he is ahead in the polls. He sees these things as political vulnerabilities, but it doesn't mean that he won't do them the second he returns to office, should that unfortunately come to pass. Uh, that's exactly right, Nicole. I mean, you can think about Project 2025 as the contract, writ contract with America written for the Trump years, and maybe a 1,000 pages instead of 10 pages. But it is the hard right doctrine that today's Trump movement, Republican Party's Trump movement, really embraces. And I think it was important that you put up the faces and the names of the people involved, because that is where Donald Trump's suggestion that he doesn't know anything about it and then it's arm's length from him, that really fails the smell test, if you will. Because we know Donald Trump, someone personally devoid of any ideology, but he chases hard right ideology to win because there's this movement in his name that he is willing to give energy to and fuel to. And so, look, it, the comparisons, say to, say, to Goldwater or Gingrich's movement, I think, are consistent with Project 2025 in terms of the platforming and mainstreaming of economic inequality. At, at its heart, conservative economic policy ignores the results uh, of economic inequality. That is baked in. And so certainly that would be reason for many people to oppose it. I think what is so shocking and so stark in 2024 compared to the 1960s and the 1994 is this continued willingness among Heritage and Project 2025 advocates to roll back civil rights protections, be it in the, within the LGBT community, because the move to say we are going to allow businesses and, and other institutions or states to begin to make rules around LGBT protections, or be it in the area of reproductive freedom. This notion where Donald Trump finds it convenient to say, yeah, we're just getting the federal government out of it. We're going to roll it back to the states. He knows exactly what that means. And so if you are, if you are anything from center right to the left, Project 2025 should scare you for an ideological purpose. But if you recognize the import of the federal's role and the court's role, 
and protecting civil rights and protections around civil rights. That's where all Americans, regardless of ideology, should really be terrified of Project 2025. Look all around the world today and you will find the lessons and the warnings and the stark reminders of the incredibly high historic stakes of November's presidential election here and in the fight for democracy against autocracy all over the world. In France, voters came out in force for parties on the left and the center to deny that country's far right a chance at running the government for the first time since World War II. It was a stunning upset made possible by an extraordinary effort by parties and voters from across that center to center left ideological spectrum to put aside differences and unite when faced with an authoritarian threat. Hundreds of miles away, the deadliest and most devastating war in Europe since the Second World War grinds on and has taken a grisly turn this weekend. Russia struck Ukraine's largest children's hospital on Monday as part of a barrage of strikes all across that country. Vladimir Putin shows no sign of drawing back his ambition of recreating Soviet-era power, believing he can and will outlast the West's attention span and resolve in its support for Ukraine. It's a notion seemingly confirmed by ex-President Donald Trump's own former national security advisor, who says this, quote, Putin is waiting for Trump. Even further afield, Hungarian leader Viktor Orban, another favorite of Donald Trump's, has been repeatedly praised and was recently met with Donald Trump, met with another of the ex-president's favorite autocrats, Xi Jinping. All of this is the context for the mother of all battles the preservation of democracy that's taking place right here in our country, in these United States. An election, our next guest, bottom lines for us by arguing, essentially, if Trump wins, America ends. Let that sink in. With the very successful incumbent president, President Joe Biden, facing some pretty strong political headwinds 120 days ahead of the November election, with voters currently telling pollsters they prefer President Biden's predecessor, Donald Trump, in every major poll that we have seen. Democrats are right now grappling with the question of who is the best person to prosecute the case against Donald Trump and his clearly flagrantly authoritarian agenda. President Joe Biden today, in an interview with the host of Morning Joe, answering that question, saying, I am, and warning that no one should ever count him out. Listen. You may remember, I was one of the few people out there publicly saying before the 2022 election, there will be no red wave. There will be no red wave. Because I've been all over the country. I didn't believe it at all. And then in 2023, the key elections, I went into those races. Not every one of them, but a lot of them. And I said we were going to win. Look, we won those. So, Joe, it wasn't just that it didn't happen. I was predicting beforehand it would not happen because I've got a pretty good political instinct and I. And here's the deal. It's not going to happen here this time around. The American public is not going to move away from me as an average voter. He, he called the Americans in the cemeteries from World War I suckers and losers. And so this guy's going to have to start to answer for what he did. I'm not letting up, Joe. I am not letting up a little bit. And by the way, you know, you know, France registered, uh, you know, I, I, look, you talk about Europe. France rejected extremism. Democrats will reject it here as well. Trump and, you know, this is a, this is a guy who is, is an extreme candidate. I can't think of a candidate in my lifetime that's been more extreme. He makes George Wallace look like a right. patriot. It's where we start today with Yale University history professor and author of the best-selling book on tyranny, 20 Lessons from the 20th Century. Tim Snyder's back with us. Um, it struck me when you said yes to being here that this is the second time in an hour of real crisis we have turned to you. Um, the last time we had the privilege of speaking with you, it was on um, the day that our company had brought on Ron McDaniel, and we really turned to you to understand the moment and understand why it was so difficult, and, and obviously she's no longer with the company, but, but so much of what you help people understand is that authoritarianism isn't just what the authoritarian takes, which is a lot of what Trump seems to perceive it is, but a lot of what is given freely. And I, and I, wonder, I wonder if you can help us understand this moment in that context. 
Well, that's that's a wonderful question. Yeah, the, the first lesson of on tyranny, which you're kind enough to mention, is is don't obey in advance. And I think for all of us, and perhaps especially for the media, it's it's very important not to assume that the right has to win. It's very important not to make adjustments for how we would behave should Trump win before he does win. And because most Americans may not have experience with these kinds of authoritarian transitions, the part of our mind which automatically adjusts and tries to and tries to minimize risks is going to make those adjustments. And I'm afraid there is a fair amount of that already going on in the media right now. We are in general much softer on Trump. And I think one of the reasons for that is that people aren't confronting um, perhaps their own fears or their own anticipation about what might happen to them or their colleagues, their institutions, should Trump actually come to power. There's an ironic way in which the thing that one really has to report, which is what would an American regime change towards fascism look like? That very thing can also deter you from doing it because it's hard to confront or you're worried that you're going to be the one to say the thing which is going too far. I, I need you to say more. And I, and I think that what you're putting your finger on is this. Um, it is true that every journalist is at risk professionally, their physical safety, their ability to do the jobs that sent them to journalism school or, or whatever it is that got them into the role of, of a working press. It is all on the line in the election. So, so journalists, not a single one of them, is an objective, detached actor in this election. But what you're describing feels like, like an inability for the mind to adapt to that because, because you're also trained in objectivity. Just talk a little bit more about how that balance can be struck. Yeah, I, that's a wonderful question, and it's one that reporters in war zones and in authoritarian regimes and uh, have had to confront since there's ever been reporting. Um, a lot of my friends, not just inside but outside the United States, are reporting in situations where they are, in some sense or another, at risk. And I think it's you're right. You can't, in that situation, just treat yourself as a neutral observer. I think everyone, you know, we're all human. Everyone has to confront the fear. Because the problem is if you don't acknowledge and confront the fear, you'll drift towards the things that are easier to say. So, for example, I think the debate around you know, who's, who the Democratic candidate can be is perfectly reasonable to have. But when everyone piles on and when everyone says the same thing about Mr. Biden, then one begins to think, OK, perhaps we're saying this because it's the easiest thing to say. Perhaps we're going to feel courageous doing the thing which is, in fact, safe. And perhaps, you know, the, the deep down, it's the fear of what will happen to us if Trump wins, which is pushing us all in this same direction direction. And that would be normal. That would be human. That would be historically what happens. But it's a level, I think, of self-awareness that all of us who write, including journalists, have to have to develop in this particular time. Because the irony is, if you don't confront your own fear, then your fears actually become reality. If you don't confront your fear, if you make it easier for this candidate, you're actually putting yourself in danger. You're actually generating the very danger that you're afraid of because you're making it easier for that person to come to power. I mean, it's it's also sort of an, an abuse and trauma paradigm, right? With the dictator or the autocrat or the tyrant as the abuser, and and, and you sort of adapt if, if you think you're going to have to live under the abuser's rule or, or power. Can, can we sort of go through, because you, you mentioned the debate, and I want to read from your Substack yesterday. Uh, let, let me do that first, because I, I, I want to ask you to be prescriptive for us. I think we're all looking for guiding lights, and, and I think you already know you're, you're one of mine. You write this about fascism and fear. When media folks describe discussions among Democrats as chaos and disarray, they are implicitly suggesting that it is better for a leader of a party to never be questioned. An obvious point goes missed. Democrats can say what they want because none of them is afraid, and that's good. Governor Maura Healey can express her dissent, and Joe Biden can express his frustration with her, but no one is worried about her physical safety. Trump, by contrast, controls his party through stochastic terror threats issued through social media that his cult followers can be expected to realize. Republicans leave politics because they fear for themselves and their families. Those who remain all obey in advance. That is new, and it should not become normal, and it should not spread any further. But it becomes normal when we treat discussions and not coercion 
as abnormal. This is what, I think this is what has so, um, I don't know the right word, but traumatized or upset our viewers. They think there's some disloyalty to the good guy in covering the debate. But I, I hear you making a distinction between the debate happened and it was covered that day, but the frenzy is what becomes asymmetric. Is that right? Yeah, th this is this is tricky. I mean, I have maybe a slightly different view um, about the, what the debate means. I mean, for for somebody who wants American democracy to continue, my view is the debate actually. I, I mean, honestly, I see it in kind of positive terms. I see it as an opportunity for there to be a discussion at whatever level that discussion needs to be had. The president obviously is has he's the presumptive nominee. He has the delegates. It's entirely up to him. He's had an incredible first term, but I think it makes sense for, for there to be a discussion. If we don't think there should be a discussion, then suddenly we are a little bit acting like, well, there's a cult of personality around the president, or it's all us versus them. And anybody who says that there should be a discussion, they're somehow part of a plot, or they're actually. On the other side or whatever it whatever it might be but it makes it harder and that's why i wrote the piece you mentioned it makes it harder um, to have that discussion which takes a little bit of courage after all if the press is piling on the president because then you really do feel like well maybe i'm being a little disloyal or i'm just part of the pile on um, because other people are afraid it makes it harder for you to do the right thing and i think that's the way this discussion has been warped right now i mean i think a lot of good people who have something to think about are having a harder time doing it because they perceive well look everybody else is afraid everybody else is piling on everybody else is doing this this easy thing so i have to be in a defensive crouch i have to protect i have to protect my guy so i think there's a way in which people's overall fear of trump and of the regime change shapes discussions which might not even seem to be directly about that thing. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't have the discussions. The bottom line here is that we're not going anywhere. I am not going anywhere. I wouldn't be running if I didn't absolutely believe that I am the best candidate to beat Donald Trump in 2024. So defiant President Joe Biden this morning on the air with our colleagues, Joe and Mika, that appearance comes on the heels just a few minutes after it was made public that he'd sent a letter to congressional Democrats, president saying that he would not bow out of the race, saying in part, quote, voters and the voters alone decide the nominee. President Biden went on to say this, quote, the question of how to move forward has been well aired for over a week now. It's time for it to end. We have one job, and that is to beat Donald Trump. Any weakening of resolve or lack of clarity about the task ahead only helps Trump and hurts us. Joining our conversation, NBC News White House correspondent Mike Mamley, plus the host of the On Brand podcast, Donnie Deutsch. So, Donnie, you heard from, from Timothy Snyder, who is um, sort of the closest thing I have to a North Star to ha how to cover this moment where the threat isn't a, a Republican president that I disagree with, but regime change, something autocratic and not democratic in nature, something that changes the world in which our kids grow up in from something unrecognizable to the world we grew up in. And and he seemed to, to draw a line and, and, and say that, that these questions and this process on the Democratic side is 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 healthy, is, is allowable. And in that spirit, I ask you your thoughts on this moment. Yeah, um, I was, it's a privilege to follow um, Professor Snyder. I, I think he's just incredible. We have an obligation at this point to ask questions. It's very simple. We do, cannot be in a woulda, coulda, shoulda situation. I don't subscribe to this. Everybody pile in behind President um, Biden right now. I love Joe Biden. He's done a great job. This is an inflection point. And this is, we ask ourselves one question. Who is the best path to beat Donald Trump? Is it Joe Biden right now? And he's, he's nicked up and he's, he's, he's definitely wounded from that last debate. Or are there alternatives? Kamala Harris, maybe not even Kamala Harris. God forbid I said that. I'm just saying this is the time we ask and we talk. This is a democracy. We're not the other side. We don't just all of a sudden say we're told to do something so it's time to lock in. No. This is a moment in time, and I think for some reason we've been given this moment in time. And I don't want to hear letters from people saying, oh, you're not behind Joe Biden. I'm going to be behind with all my heart and soul whoever the Democratic candidate is. The problem with Joe Biden right now as a Democratic candidate is, Nicole, you've said this many times on your show, if it's a referendum on Donald Trump, we win. If it's a referendum on Joe Biden, we lose. 
I don't know how you get that referendum back on Trump. The problem is you're going to have a billion plus dollars coming in, reminding every day or suggesting every day or mandating every day that, that Joe Biden can't do the job. And how do we get the conversation back to Donald Trump? And that's the, can somebody else do that better? So what I want right now from the American public, from every politician, from every journalist, from every voter, is to just, just not just necessarily lock in line, and maybe that is the right move, but this is when we say, is there a better path? Is there an all-female ticket? Oh my God, I said that. I'm just saying things that all of a sudden you go, oh. And I just, we need to talk about it right now because this is the time. A Couple of weeks from now, three weeks from now, is not the time. So we are opposite from the other side. We tell the truth. And we question things, and we openly question things. And I don't think anybody should be told not to question right now. Yeah, I mean, Mike Memoli, one of the things the White House seems to be latched onto that, that is demonstrably false is that this isn't a voter problem. This is a massive voter problem. 75% of all voters think he's too old. And I agree that this is a referendum on Donald Trump because he is an existential threat to the American way of life. But this isn't something that the, the media cooked up. This is something that the media largely ignored for years as voters you know, raised their hand and said, ooh, I'm worried about this thing. Yeah, Nicole, that's right. I mean, part of, though, what we're hearing from White House officials, and I've been on the road with the president in the last few days as well, is that these concerns about both candidates have existed before the debate, and they persist, and in some cases may have worsened after the debate. But what the Biden team has not seen in their, their internal research, but also in all of the public polling that's been revealed, is the kind of attrition of his support to the degree that justifies the kind of public panic that they're seeing and trying to manage among Democratic establishment figures right now. Now, two things could be true, though, Nicole. That can be true, but also remember that it's the Biden team itself that called the play. They were the ones that pushed for and Trump quickly agreed to having an earlier debate than we've ever had in the modern history of presidential debates. It was part of an effort to try to drive the conversation to those voters who have been most disengaged to focus on this choice. It is between President Biden and former President Trump. And the conversation that's been going on since that debate has not been about what Donald Trump said during that debate and the kind of threat to democracy that the campaign has been arguing he poses. But it's been about whether Joe Biden, forget about whether he can campaign and win the job in the next 120 some odd days, but whether he can even do the job for the next four years. And so that's the moment we find ourselves in now and why the Biden team has really tried to reframe this moment with a much more aggressive pushback in the last 72 hours as one in which President Biden is representing the will of the voters and his party. Those who are calling for him to step aside are only among those elites who have frankly never been with him in the first place and don't have never quite seen his real political appeal from day one. I, I just want to challenge, I want to challenge Mike for a second. First of all, it's not panic to question. It's panic to not question, frankly. And it's not just elites. Let, let's not be sold to blue goods. It's a lot of people that have a question about Joe Biden now. We will get behind Joe Biden. We will get behind whoever the candidate is. But let's not be afraid to imagine, to what the professor said before. Let's not let fear dictate us. I love Joe Biden. And if Joe Biden is a candidate, I'm all in. But this is the moment in time we throw everything on the table. The panic thing to do is to not do that. Are you personally concerned about the former president's threats against you should he be reelected? Uh, of course. Uh, I think anyone who's on his enemies list should be concerned. Because, what, what scares you most? What concerns you most? Well, what concerns me the most is what the court just did was to basically tell Donald Trump, um, you can do anything through the Justice Department. You can do anything through the military. These are core responsibilities of the president of the United States. You will have unquestioned immunity for whatever you do. Was Congressman Adam Schiff yesterday on the disgraced ex-president's personal threats against him, further emboldened now by the United States Supreme Court's immunity decision. It is part of a terrifying and growing trend, the mainstreaming of open calls for political violence under the rhetorical air cover provided by the disgraced ex-president. On Sunday, the Republican nominee for North Carolina's governor, Lieutenant Governor Mark Robinson, in remarks given at a church, said this, quote, some folks need killing. Take a look. We now find ourselves struggling with people who have evil intents. You know, it was a time when we used to meet evil on the battlefield, and guess what we did to it? We killed it. Some liberal somewhere is going to say that sounds awful. 
too bad. Get mad at me if you want to. Some folks need killing. It's time for somebody to say it. Those comments come on the heels of sitting Supreme Court Justice Samuel Alito, who was recorded in a conversation with a left wing activist who he thought was a political ally, talking about how difficult it is to live peacefully with people on the left, the liberals. Quote, there can be a way of working, a way of living together peacefully, but it's difficult, you know, because there are differences on fundamental things that really cannot be compromised, end quote. And as we just showed you earlier in the hour, the head of Project 2025, which laid out the agenda for Trump's second term, Kevin Roberts, confirming some of Congressman Schiff's worst fears about the Supreme Court's recent immunity ruling. Roberts saying the Supreme Court has unleashed a second American revolu revolution, which, quote, will remain bloodless if the left allows it to be. We're back with Ruth, David, and Angelo. Um, Ruth, political violence and the fear of political violence coming and, 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 and endangering not just the person in the arena, but, but your family is a tool of the autocrat. It's the, it's the fundamental thing. And um, this is what got me uh, into following Trump in 2016. I saw that he was using his rallies uh, for a reason that goes back to fascism, that you need to change people's perception of violence. You need to, to get them to see violence as sometimes justified, sometimes necessary. And so Trump used his rallies from 2015 onwards, and this was the basis of my report for the January 6th committee, as radicalization vehicles. And he would say, in the old days, you could beat up people. Um, and then he's engaging much later in dehumanizing rhetoric. And he's created a climate, uh, of course, saying also, you know, he could stand on Fifth Avenue and shoot someone launching his campaign at Waco, Texas, where, you know, a pilgrimage site for extremists, going to a gun store and looking at a, a Glock with his name on it. Uh, you know, it's not subtle. And, and of course, praising uh, murderous dictators all over the world. So, so changing the perception of violence in Americans' minds, that violence becomes the way you solve differences. That's what some of these quotes were saying. You don't reason, you don't discuss, you kill. Um, you beat up, you jail, and then you torture. And this is the terrain of authoritarianism, and this is what uh, I'm, I'm most worried about. He has created a permission structure for, you know, all kinds of people to air their most bloodthirsty uh, fantasies, and this is the way you do politics now for some of these people. Ruth, thank you for sticking around. Um, you two stayed longer than we had asked you to, and I know you have to go, but thank you very much um, for all of your thoughts and, and wisdom today. We're really grateful. Um, David Jolly, the truth about all of this is that it's already happened, right? We live in a post-January 6th world. We live in a post-Paul Pelosi attack world. We live in a post-normalization of political violence world. And you know what Donald Trump knows about all that? It is a big bleeping political loser. It's a big ugly bruise on his shiny new, um, you know, thing he wants to project. I I'm so informed by uh, the new book, Apprentice in Wonderland, that Trump's just trying to get renewed for another season, that he is this effective sort of accidental autocrat because he is pathological narcissist. You know, he needs to be renewed. He needs the ratings. He needs to be elevated. It's a dangerous combination, but there's always been this sort of reptilian survival instinct that, that Trump reveals here and there. And you see it in the shaving off of the corners on the platform, where he knows that who he is and what he is is unelectable if the country stays focused on the choice. How do you make sure that happens? Yeah, so look, I agree with you. I think Donald Trump led primarily by his own narcissism, but secondly, the incentive structure. He created a following, and the following is demanding more and more of this drug of absolute power. And, I, and what worries me about what's different this go around and now eight to 10 years into this is the followers before were hard to identify. And then we've seen them grow in their in their public expression of using violence. January 6th being a perfect example, the Paul Pelosi attack you mentioned as well. But now we're seeing followers get elected or hold office or run, right? The, the North Carolina candidate for 
uh, for governor. Who does he believe should be killed? I'll give you another example. An open request, uh, open records request in Florida just revealed that during some protests in the state of Florida, a staff member for Joe B or for Ron DeSantis told state law enforcement, "Go arrest some people." And when they said, "We can't," he said, "Just arrest a couple people for the governor. We'll get your back. Don't worry about it." Those types of actions now are a movement that Donald Trump created, and you're seeing it in Project 2025. Let's now use the authority of the state for this. What? started out as accidental authoritar authoritarianism led by narcissism, is now doctrine in today's Republican Party. And I think that's the most dangerous part. And so you see Joe Biden, for instance, having to wrestle with running on a traditional Democratic platform while also meeting the moment of protecting American democracy against this type of movement. And what I worry most about, <laughs> though I guess it would be the dark lining on a bright cloud, is if indeed America steps up and defeats Trumpism in November, we know Donald Trump will not accept the results of that election. And we now know his followers will get his back in doing whatever it takes to overturn it. Many of those followers now occupying the offices of secretaries of state across the country, offices of governor across the state, state attorneys general, and other people with real power who effectuate this autocratic movement that Donald Trump has unleashed. You know, Angela, I've, I've said for a long time, you know, no one's coming to save us, and that's the good news. You know, the only people left with any, you know, Jack Smith had the ill-fated intervention of the United States Supreme Court and, and a late start. Um, the efforts in New York look like they've been slowed. He was successfully held accountable for his crimes, but now sentencing is delayed. Um, he now has the Supreme Court that has its back. The only bulwark against any of this is to, to do what Tim Snyder said, to make sure America doesn't end, to make sure Donald Trump isn't elected ever again. That he, as Liz Cheney says, is never anywhere close to the Oval Office ever again. How much of what you understand about the agenda is, based on everything we know about this moment in politics, repulsive to the mainstream voter? It is repulsive. All the polling shows that. I mean, all the polling shows are positive, and as you noted, you know, Trump knows that. I mean, he, that's why he had, a, you know, like mm -hmm. sandpaper, smoothed out the edges of some of these things, because he knows how to engage with the moment. He's not going to lose large numbers of people uh, for some core policy thing. But I think part of the issue, though, is that even though they, they, they would vote against it, that doesn't mean they'd fight for it. And that's sort of the difference. That's why this, mm. this moment right now is actually very pivotal, right? Because it's one thing to say, oh, that's all putting and I have a reasonable choice in front of me. I can choose to go down that direction or I can choose to go you know, in the favor of democracy. But once that choice is made, uh, most of those people, as, as history shows us, they don't, they're not going to fight for it. That's why heroes are heroes, right? Because they're not going to fight for it. And that's the part that's so incredible about this moment and important, as you noted, is that that's where we're, we're at this, in, this inflection point. And you know, I don't think enough of people have really woken up yet around it. Um, you know, even, you know, the clip around Mark Robinson, I think back to you know, when you think about waking people up, part of that starts with the news media and journalists and reporters. And, and one of the framings that I've, I've heard you say a bunch of times, and I, I, I really appreciate it, is that you talk about us being in a post-January 6th world, that that is a moment that we have to start defining a before and after for, because things really changed. And I don't think that that post-January 6th sort of mentality has really filtered into the way newsrooms operate. I'll give an example about Mark Robinson. He said this thing, but that's not an anomaly for him. That's who he is. Mm -hmm. But if you go back and look at the coverage, the news coverage of Mark Robinson when he when he became the nominee, you know, the New York Times and their reporting was describing him as a, a fiery, a firebrand and a fiery conservative with new ideas. And it was like, that's OK, fine. But like, you, they didn't capture the venom, the history, the violence, his endorsement of it, his might makes right sort of approach. Um, they just report him as if another you know, Republican, maybe with some wacky ideas or a, 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 an extra personality. And that's really where the trouble is, is that and it's not just the Times. It was endemic across the entire news media is that they have they don't have the tools yet for engaging with the question that's in front of us. And so they're using old language and old models and old style of storytelling for a very, very different story, a post-January 6th story. And that's where it all comes together, because if you think about it in the arc of Trump, in 2016, if you think about his outside force, it was bikers for Trump. If you, in 2020, the outside group, the, the, the arm, was the Proud Boys. Now it's explicitly mm -hmm. paramilitary operations. You have Patriot Front yeah. and others like them marching in his events and engaging in violence, and he's openly courting it. So part of the challenge there is that even he's shifted in his approach and who he's engaging as the outsider. So we have all the pieces and all the touchstones, but the storytellers haven't quite figured out how to present that story for the people, as you noted, in the middle 
um, that would be persuaded uh, to take action now, but certainly won't take action after November. Hey there, MSNBC fans. I'm Luke Russert, and be sure to join me, Rachel Maddow, Jen Psaki, Lawrence O'Donnell, Steve Kornacki, Joy Reid, and many more September 7th in Brooklyn, MSNBC Live Democracy 2024. Click on the link for ticket information. We will see you there.